and girls, we've got sort of, this is kind of cool. It's like family day at Connected North. Uh, today we are connecting to Craig Birch and he is a, is it a water bomb pilot? Is that the correct term for it, Craig? Yep, that's it. Yeah, water bomber pilot. Yeah, he uh, works with planes um, who control fires all over Northwestern Ontario and other parts of Canada. And when we did this session with the students in Iqaluit this, this winter, they were fascinated just like by everything, by the plane, by the process, by some of the videos that he had. We were learning about the um, principles of flight, but it really is a, a fabulous um, presentation and a, quite a unique job that Craig has. So I, uh, Katie asked him to, to join us today to talk about flight and the job the job that the career that he's chosen and hopefully we'll have a chance to do a little bit of an experiment with a piece of paper if you can go and get a piece of paper um, for an experiment later on but i'm going to turn you over to craig and um katie's right beside him so katie how do you want to handle questions do you want craig to go right through or do you want craig to read the questions as we go I think Craig will see a question come up and he can just answer it on the fly if it's related to what he's talking about. And then if there's anything that we miss at the end, maybe you can keep tabs on the ones that, the ones that we miss. Yeah. I'm sure he's going to talk, uh, see about where he stores his plane and all of that, because that's part of what he does. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Craig, and enjoy. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to pin Craig here. So we're not going to talk so much about uh, like the theory of flight and stuff like that. Uh, more about my job as a water bomber pilot and how I got into it and um, just some of the things I do and any questions that you guys have. And then if, uh, if we have time, then we'll make a paper airplane at the end of it. We found a cool paper airplane that works really well. So. Um, so my name is Craig Birch. I'm a water bomber pilot in Dryden. Uh, we have planes that are based in both Dryden and Sudbury usually, um, but we move them around depending on where the hazard is. So even though we're based in Dryden, we'll often spend time. I just got back from Chapel from a ship in Chapel and then we, we had planes in Red Lake and Thunder Bay as well, often up in Pickle Lake. Uh, I live in Sioux Lookout though. Um, and uh, yeah, so I commute down to Dryden typically, and uh, it all depends on the hazard and how much uh, of a fire risk there is at the time. Um, so should we start the sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. sure. Can everybody see Craig's slide? Just put a yes in the chat if you can see Craig's slide. Awesome. Okay, so the the plane I fly is called the CL four fifteen water bomber. It's a plane that's Canadian designed and Canadian made, and it was originally made by a company called Canada Air. And then they became Bombardier, and now it's owned by a company called uh, Viking out in uh, British Columbia. Does anyone know what the plane looks like? Have you guys ever seen a water bomber? What color it is? Take a guess. See if you can figure out what color it might be. Red, somebody says. Aaron said red. Ooh, that's a good prediction. Owen said yellow, Sigrid said yellow, red, red because it's like fire. Okay, let's take a look. There we go. So that's the Ontario water bombers. Uh, most of the water bombers are yellow. They're yellow with uh, either black and white or uh, some red and white. Uh, out in Newfoundland, they're actually, uh, they call them peas and carrots because they're actually colored green and orange. They look just like the color of peas and carrots. Um, so 
It's a fully amphibious airplane. Does anyone know what amphibious means? Take a guess. What do you think amphibious airplane means? Anyone know? The airplane is amphibious. Maybe Craig could spell it in the chat and you guys can guess what it means. It means it's big from May thinks amphibious means big. Gabby Griffiths said land in water and on land. Ooh, Sarah's making a prediction that it's about an animal. Okay, maybe Craig can explain that. Yeah, so if something is amphibious, it lives on both land and water. So our plane can stop on the water just like a boat and it floats there nicely and in some places over in Italy they actually park them on the water overnight. So even though most of the time when we're scooping water we don't stop, it is capable of stopping and it floats just like a boat does. Uh, but it also has wheels. You can see the wheels underneath on and on the side. The ones on the side are tracked up into the side of the fuselage. That's the body of the plane and the one in the nose tracks up and then it gets fully hidden up inside these little doors here and that makes it so that it can land on the water and then when we're on the ground oops. when we're on the ground the wheels are extended out below so that it sits and then we can usually end up doing most of our maintenance and stuff like that on the ground and we park them on the ground overnight So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, it is a large airplane. Uh, you can see the guy sitting in the cockpit of the plane there. Uh, when we've got a load of water on, it actually weighs 7,000 pounds. So that's quite a bit of weight. Empty, it's closer to about 30 pounds without the fuel or, or the water on 30,000 pounds. Um, yeah. So, yeah, on this uh, picture, it's just about to touch down. You can see the wheels on the side of it that are folded up so that they do not dangle in the water touching down. But they stay outside of the plane just like that on the side. It's only the one in the nose that folds right up on the side. Lots of kids say OMG Craig. That yeah. looks pretty scary. So the the main purpose is to scoop up water and then drop it on forest fires. Uh, it only takes about 12 seconds to fill the plane up, and that picks up 13,000 pounds of water. What do you so guys think that these two flaps are for that you're seeing right now? What do you think those do? They're doors. That's a, They're that's a doors. Clue. What do you think those doors do? They're thinking. Wowzers. They pick up water. Aaron thinks it picks up water. Owen and Aiden think it lets water out, lets water in. That's actually what I thought at first, is those doors let the water in. But Craig's going to tell us what happens. Yeah, those are actually the doors that let the water out. There's actually two more you can see over on the far side. You can only see one of them there, but that's for the water to come out. The scoops are actually over here. Can you guys see my cursor? Can you see the cursor on there? Over here on the right hand side, there's two little scoops. And those little scoops are what we use to scoop the water up. So they're not that big. They're actually only about this big. And there's one on each one on each side, and that's what scoops up all the water. So when we touch down, we're still flying at about almost 100 miles per hour. So that water gets picked up really fast. There's no pumps or anything that suck it in. It just gets jammed in there because we're going forward, and those scoops hang down in front of the into the water. And how fast do you fill up your tanks? Uh, it takes about 12 seconds to fill it up. And how much so is that's that? 13,000 pounds. So that's about 6,100 liters. So that's about the same as 50 bathtubs. 
In 12 seconds. In 12 seconds, yeah. Wow. And how long does it take to let the water out? Uh, only one second. Wow. Yeah, it all falls out pretty quickly. Right. There we go. So there's a couple pictures as well. The first one on the left hand side is coming in. This was actually part of a drop test that we did in Dryden, where they were actually measuring where the water goes, how much it spreads out, how much goes through the trees, and what kind of footprint it has. So we had a bunch of photographers on site, which was really neat. So that's actually me flying in the plane that time. And that's the water coming out. Um, when we are picking it up, we can feel the drag. Uh, it's only really initially when you just first touch down, it wants to pull the nose down into the water. But once you stop it, it's pretty stable. And then we bring our power up just like we're, uh, just like we're taking off from the land all the way up to our takeoff power. And then as soon as we lift the probes up, it only takes about another five seconds and then we're airborne. So it's a pretty quick process. It doesn't take that long. You need about a, um, about a mile of lake. So that's about a one and a half kilometers and that's lots of room for us to get in and out. Now, Kian has a question and that's a really good one, Craig, because there's been lots of rumors about planes, water bottling planes, accidentally picking up fish and scuba divers and seaweed. Is that possible for people to be picked up in the probes? Yeah, definitely <laughs> not, not anything of any size. You can't pick up any people. You can't pick up sticks. You couldn't pick up any fish. Uh, the, the holes, like the whole float or the whole scoop is only is about this big. And that scoop is divided into quarters. And then each quarter has another little divider. So it only divides it into eights. So it really, you can only get something about the size of my thumb. That's about as big of anything that you could fit, fit inside the, uh, inside the scoop. Maybe now would be a good time to show a video of the airplane scooping up water. Would you guys like to sure. see a video of the airplane scooping up the water? Okay, let's open it up. Uh, so I'm wondering how the, you don't need to hear sound, but Mally, just let us know that you can see the video that's on the screen right now. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, I guess we should build a clip on it. Just one sec, boys and girls. We're just, is that a picture or is it a video? Oh, it's a video. Just showing it as a JPEG. Just showing it as a picture, yeah. So we're here, share with me. Share with me. Oh. Okay. 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 This is, can you see the video? Can you guys see the video? Maybe just uh, sit in the chat if you can see. Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. Yep. So this was actually out in Montana. We were uh, we went down to go help there while they had a bunch of fires up in some mountains. So this is one of the other planes I was filming. I was in the second airplane. We were actually scooping at the same time. And, um, but I took the video. My, uh, the fellow that I was flying with was uh, flying at the time. How long does it take to fly to Montana? Oh, that was quite a while. It took us about, uh, probably about five hours. So our planes aren't really meant for, a lot of long distance, fast flying. They're more of a, a workhorse. So they're not really designed for long distance, fast flying. Uh, we always have two pilots in the plane um, and we both take turns when we're flying so that it's always one person or the other 
and then we just share that as we uh, as we fly. All right, so how do I get back to uh, the video here, Katie? I just go back to the chat. Like, oh. yeah. I don't know. Um, you want to play that? Yeah, maybe we can actually select that. But we'll just we'll do this one. So this is a drop. This actually happened out in Newfoundland, I believe. There was an accident between a tractor trailer and a grader. And the tractor trailer ended up catching fire. And they called in a water bomber, actually, to come and uh, help put it out. If you look at the water bomber when you fly it, you'll see the the colors on it. This is the this is a Newfoundland water bomber. This is why they call them peas and carrots. Whoa. So there's actually quite a bit of pressure, Sigrid. Uh, it's actually, um, it can actually be quite dangerous for people on the ground. Uh, whenever we're dropping on a fire, uh, we always make sure that the ground crews are uh, clear of the area that we're working on. Um, the biggest hazard to them is actually things like falling branches and stuff like that, because it's really easy to uh, break like the top six or eight feet of a, a tree off something like a, a spruce tree or a pine tree and it's that's more uh, likely to, to injure the, the people than the, the water itself is but if you were standing up it would definitely send you flying it would certainly hurt somebody if, it, uh, if they caught a, a full load out in the open or something like that you guys well i bet they probably want to see that one more time craig i i do Sure, that's a good one. Everybody <laughs> likes to see that one. Actually, can you show it full screen, Katie? Yeah, just uh, uh, pause it, Craig. Or oh, yeah, that'll work. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty cool video. And while, while that's happening, Carol's wondering if radios on the plane communicate with the ground crew. Yeah. So if you actually look in the video, you can see there's another plane behind the water bomber. Uh, that plane, or actually that one there was a helicopter. But we have uh, radios that will communicate with the guys on the ground. But most of the time, we have somebody else that's with us called a bird dog. And they coordinate everybody all together they're kind of like an air traffic controller in the sky so this is a picture of them they fly over top and they mostly direct us where they want the drops and they keep in contact with the ground crews to make sure that they're a safe distance away and then they also coordinate helicopters or any other planes that might be coming into the area as well at the same time so, but we do have radios so that we can talk to the people on the ground. And sometimes we, uh, we will work with them if the, if for some reason we're out there and there's a bird dog that's not around, or maybe the bird dog had to go back early for some reason, but we can talk with the guys on the ground. Um, there are some spotter planes as well, and they don't usually work with us. They just go out and fly over areas that they think that there's a fire hazard and they'll report back if they see a fire um, but those are different those are detection planes so do you notice the heat from the fire because is there special protection on the plane when you're close to a fire um there isn't any special protection on the plane uh the paint is just regular paint but we can feel the heat in the, in the airplane we we even have air conditioning in the airplanes 
but sometimes if we're flying along the side, we can actually get to uh, get close enough if we're depending on where we're dropping and how big the fire is. It actually feels like you're standing in front of an open oven. It's it's actually quite a bit of of heat on that comes off of the fires. There's some fire pictures. Um, it it all depends on the size of the fire. Uh, Kian or Kian asked how many how long it takes to put uh, a fire out, and it depends on the size. A fire like this would take quite a while. Uh, it usually what ends up putting the fires out the really big fires ends up being the rain. Um, we mostly are there to help try to direct it and control it. Um, but the uh, some fires we've gone back to for you know weeks and weeks on end. Some of them will burn for over a month. Um, but other ones that are nice and small, we can put them out with just one load, and then they send a helicopter and a ground crew in to to make sure that it's out. Um, yeah, Jordan said it looks like the clouds are touching the ground. The clouds in this picture are actually up above, but large fires will actually create their own clouds and they can actually create their own weather as well. Um, you can actually, we don't fly in the smoke. Alec asked, asked if we, how we see and breathe in the smoke. So we don't spend a whole lot of time in the smoke, um, but we do fly through it. Uh, but we need to be able to see where we're going all the time. We do also though have We've got another video here, which is a pretty neat video. So this is uh, oh, the secret asked if I worked with the Kanjikan fires last year, and I did. I have I might even have some videos from that. Um, this fire here, though, is from one two years ago. It was over in Tobogamy, and this is a picture of our forward-looking infrared camera. So if you look down in the front here on the bottom. There's a screen there. It's not a very, it was pretty rough and bumpy. So that's actually the fire. You can see out the front window, the smoke makes it kind of difficult to see, but you can still see the trees there. This is the uh, uh, fire up that was in Tobogamy. It was called North Bay 69 last year. And then that, so the bright stuff is the heat from the fire. Uh, the camera always shows a relative. Uh, a relative image. So the cold things show up as dark and the hot things show up as light. So the dark black stuff there that you see is the lakes. And then as we move on to the ground, you can see that there's fire. You can see where there's been drops previously. The wet spots on the ground are, are dark. Um, but we can see down, so we can see the trees. So we make sure that we're not going to fly into anything or, or uh, have an accident with anybody else. Um, but looking straight ahead is actually can be can be difficult sometimes. I have another one. This is another video here. How much surface area does one load cover for? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, okay. I'm not sure how much it actually uh, covers, but. Uh, I'm going to have to ask somebody to find out what that is. Um, so in this fire here, this is the uh, same North Bay fire by up by Tomogamy a few years ago. Uh, if you look in the top of the camera, you'll actually be able to see two uh, bright dots. And that's actually the exhaust from the plane that's in front of us. And if you're watching on the uh, infrared camera, You'll see when he drops his water, because the water is so cold, it comes out like this big black cloud that's going to fall down onto the fire. And you'll be able to see, so the, the bright spots are the fire that's down on the ground. And you'll even be able to see some of the loads from the other water bombers on the ground. So right in the top, you can just see him dropping. So that's the cloud of cold water coming down <clears throat> onto the ground as we fly past. 
and then we drop there right right behind them as well. All right, so we'll continue on with the slide for a bit here. Is there anything else that you guys want to ask? Oh, do that. What's this one here? So that's the one you just showed. I think. So there's, there's the inside of the water bomber. That's a good one. Turn it down, Doc. Yep. <clears throat> so this is a, a video that somebody else took. That's a walk around. Oops. It's a walk about around the uh, Pardon? water bomber, and I will narrate it for you. Let me show you this one. Where are you going? I'm going to go to the store. I've got a meetings with Jan and stuff. Oh, that's fine. I didn't know if you were busy. Somebody is, I can hear somebody talking here. I think I'm just going to mute some participants here. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is the outside of the water bomber on the ground. That's the engine. Uh, the engines uh, together make uh, uh, 4,800 horsepower. <clears throat> so that's as much as uh, some CN locomotives. Uh, out on the wing, there is a, something called a sponson. I'm just going to back that up. So out on the wingtip is a, a float that uh, helps keep the wing out of the water right there. So uh, when we stop on the water or when we are um, touching down, if we're uh, scooping, that keeps the wingtip up out of the water. Uh, May wants to know how do you keep entertained when you're waiting for fire or flying to Montana first? Oh, uh, well, when we're flying on the way out there, we don't actually really do much. We're just kind of working. So we're paying attention to what's happening in the airplane and just looking out the window really more than anything. We uh, keep an eye on the systems and one person is always flying the plane. We don't have an autopilot in our plane. Um, so it's uh one person gets to kind of sit and relax a little bit but uh somebody's always flying the plane there you can see the wheels and the big shocks for when we're landing on the ground how long can you fly without having to refuel first uh we we can put enough water on, or uh fuel on for about six hours of flying, um, but we don't usually put that much on because it's uh, it takes away from the amount of water that we can pick up. So we actually are limited by weight on the airplane as to how much we're allowed to make the plane weigh in total. And that's a combination of fuel and water and the plane itself. So once we're, if we're working, we always keep the plane light enough so that we can immediately take off and then start scooping water in case there's a fire right close to the airport. So we usually fly for about three and a half hours. Uh, we could go a little bit longer, but that's a, that's a pretty long flight already. Um, training wise, uh, we do special training for the water bomber specifically. But I did start out just like any other pilot with my private pilot's license and then getting my commercial pilot's license. And, and I spent uh, a number of years flying other smaller planes, mostly bush planes and some air ambulance and things like that before I got to uh, fly the water bomb and before I started flying with the US you know, for resources. Um, I did fly gliders actually down in Southern Ontario. That's where I got my first license with my glider pilot license 
I got that through the air cadets. A good shot from the video of the uh, underside of the airplane. Um, yeah, I started flying with the air cadets and I got my glider pilot's license first. I got a scholarship for that. And then I also got a scholarship for my private pilot's license. So I did those both in Southern Ontario. My glider pilot's license I did down near Trenton. And my private pilot's license I did in Cornwall. And how old were you when you got your pilot license, right? Uh, I was only 16 actually when I got my glider license and 17 when I got my pilot's license. You could fly a plane before you could drive a car? Yep, I have my <laughs> I have my pilot's license before I have my driver's license. <laughs> so one of the neat things on the side of this airplane you can see right in the center here is a, uh, a fitting so that we can actually attach the plane and fuel it up or add water to it with a, uh, a fire hydrant on the ground. So sometimes in the spring, we'll have a situation where the ground has thawed and dried out and there's a fire hazard, but the lakes are still frozen. And in that situation, we'll actually fill up on the ground and take some water off. We can't take as much water as we do when we're scooping straight from the lake. But at that time of year, it doesn't usually take a whole lot. So only every few years we'll end up in this situation and we'll just have two planes that fill up in the morning on the ground and sit for the day with a load of water on and if they uh, need us for a fire then we'll just go out and throw one or two loads on it and that's usually enough to um, keep it under control and let the ground crews go in with a, a helicopter and finish putting it out. Um, I didn't actually always want to be a water bomber pilot. I originally started off wanting to fly commercially and fly for the airlines. Um, but in the end, I ended up coming up north. I live in northwestern Ontario and I really enjoy it up here and I like <laughs> flying in the bush. And I decided that I didn't actually want to go sit in an airliner and uh, just fly passengers around it. That seems actually to be a pretty boring job when I had the opportunity to do this. So if you look on this picture above, this is a little silver post here. That's actually a mooring post for planes that uh, tie up on the water. That's where they'll put a rope around it so that they can lift like an anchor or lift up the uh, uh, the lines to a buoy. Um, and above that, this little bump on the nose is actually where that forward looking infrared camera is. That little white circle is the camera lens. Um, May asked if water bombing was dangerous, and it's it's more risky than flying an airliner from airport to airport. But we uh, have a lot of procedures that we um, did to make sure that everything was uh, done really safely, and we've been doing it since I believe the late eighties was when we first started dropping water with the older version of these airplanes they are called two fifteens. Way before May was born. And uh, <laughs> we, so we've been doing it for quite a while uh, and we've developed a whole bunch of procedures to make it as safe as possible. Um, it is a little, it's more risky. I would think this though. So this picture here, you can actually see the scoops. Uh, there's one on either side, one over on this side, and that scoop fills up one side of each scoop fills up one side of the tank. We'll see inside it in a little bit here as well. Uh, and that scoop is divided into two, and then the tanks inside are divided in half, and then each half has its own door. So we can drop water from one door at a time if we want, or two, and then the other two or we typically drop all four at the same time. Um, all four at the same time is called a salvo drop. And the, the point of that is to keep the water together. It's a heavier uh, parcel of water, so it gets down through the trees a lot better, through the branches and gets down onto the ground where the fire is. Um, but if we're fighting something like a grass fire, and we don't need to get through the trees and the canopy. 
then we'll actually do what we call an auto drop. And when we press the button, it'll open one door and then there'll be a time delay. And then the second door opens and then a time delay in the third and then a time delay in the fourth. And when we're doing that, we can actually string uh, a load of, of foam and water out over the length of about a football field. So we can actually draw it out quite a bit, but it doesn't penetrate as well when we do that. So we only do that when it's more of uh, a grass fire or something in the open where we don't need to get down through the canopy. Thanks, you want to take that quick look inside and then we'll probably have to get started on that. If you just click on the line, there's the tank. Yeah. So we'll pause there. So that's the two tanks. Uh, it actually doesn't look that big from inside, but those tanks actually extend all the way down through the floor to the very bottom of the, the water bomber. So they're they're bigger than they look. Um, but that's what. 13,000 pounds of water looks like. It fills up to about the top of this little bulge that comes out the front. And that's 6,100 liters um, total. So three, just over 3,000 liters per, per size. Um, it does change the balance, uh, not a whole lot. The, the tanks were situated intentionally very close to our center of balance. When we're flying, that's called your center of gravity. Um, so they did that for the for that point exactly, but they are a little bit forward of that point. So when we drop, the nose does actually want to uh, lift up into the air, but it, it's pretty easy to control it and to stop it. Um, the drop for a large fire, you mean for in the trees, was called a salvo. Uh, that's S A L V O. So that basically means just letting it all go at once. Yeah. That's about all that's interesting there. Maybe a little bit talk about it. So this is what it looks like in the cockpit. Uh, this little tiny camera or screen up here is where the forward looking infrared camera is. Um, the two levers right Front and center there are the throttles. Exactly. So they control how much uh, fuel is going to the engine that controls how much power is coming out. And then these two white ones down in the bottom right are called our condition levers. They add, turn the fuel on, and then they also control the RPM of the propellers by controlling the angle that they uh, that they're running at. And that and is RPM just like stands for reps per minute, right? Yeah, so that's just like uh, shifting gears in your car. That's basically what that does. Um, does anyone, so, maybe people have any burning burning questions uh, about fires, but we could maybe quickly talk about fire and what causes forest fires. Maybe you guys could ask questions. You could answer this question. We have a question coming up. Maybe Craig could click on it. Um, how do forest fires burn? Does anyone know what? scientific elements are needed for a fire to burn take a guess in the chat what do you need for a fire to burn aaron said co2 oxygen they said oxygen heat any other ideas there's three things three components that you need perfect things to happen for a fire to burn oxygen heat all right let's take a look so that's close you're just missing one there may Oxygen, heat, and fuel. So you always have to have all three of these things. If these three items are actually called the fire triangle. And they call it a fire triangle because if you take away any one of these, the triangle collapses and the fire will stop. It won't burn if there's no heat. It won't burn if there's no oxygen. And it won't burn if there's no fuel. So when we drop water, one of the what we're doing is getting rid of the heat. The water uh, suffocates it, or uh, the water cools off the, the fire and stops the heat. Um, when we drop, we actually add uh, foam to the water as well. And that foam 
also has the effect of suffocating it. It helps the uh, water stick to the leaves. It also helps it uh, soak into the ground better and it helps slow down, down how fast it evaporates. And we can make the foam really thick, like uh, we can make it thick like whipped cream. Um, and it will really smother a fire. It works super effective if we're fighting something like a grass fire. But the thicker that we make it by adding foam concentrate, the thicker we make it, the more it drifts and the more it gets caught up in the branches and in the trees. So there are two main factors that cause fires. Can you guess what they are? This is a bit of a trick question. Two main factors. There's two, two things, things that cause fires. Keep eating guess. We'll give you a minute. What causes the fire? Humans, Owen and Aiden said. Yeah. Yes, you're right about that. Anything else that causes fires in the bush, in the forest? Cigarettes? Gas? Yeah, those are all human factors. What's the non-human factor? Animals? Do not have animals mm. cause fire? Maybe maybe their poop causes insulation. Maybe. That continues the fire. Yeah. Heat from the sun. Yeah, let's have a look. So naturally caused fires are caused by lightning. Uh, um, there spontaneous is combustion is, is a very unlikely situation. Sometimes what we, we can uh, get fires from, you can actually have fires that start from things left like pop cans. They will actually heat up and reflect the sun and they can actually start fires in, in uh, super dry conditions as well. But for the most part, it's lightning. That's the naturally caused fire. And then the second one is human cause. So human caused fires would be from smoking. Cigarettes is one of the things that uh, you guessed. Uh, recreation like camping or having a shore lunch or uh, equipment, uh, logging equipment causes fires for us every year. Or uh, uh, dump the, fires is the, another big one. Yeah, that's usually for people lighting their garbage on fire. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, the trains often cause a lot of fire for us as well. Uh, sometimes they'll have a brake lock up and that'll start, it'll heat up and start sending sparks flying all over into the dry grass. And then also when they're reshaping the tracks, the tracks actually get flattened out from the trains running across them. And they actually have a grinder that goes and makes a curve on it again. So the trains run faster with less friction. Okay, I think we're almost out of time, so we should start on a paper airplane. Does anyone have any burning questions while we set up the document camera? So if you have any questions you'd like to ask Craig or about fires or about flying or anything, pop them in the chat and then we'll switch cameras here. So let's go to the top of the screen. There's orange. Yeah, and you want to just stop sharing. So boys and girls, if you want to go and get your piece of paper, that would be great. A good time to do that now. Who wants to know what your favorite thing is about flying? Answer the question. What's your favorite thing about flying, Craig? Ah, uh, favorite. Ooh, that's a tough one. Being away from your wife? Just kidding. <laughs> the uh, um, favorite thing is probably just the flying in general. The, Flying is lots of fun. It's always it's, uh, sunny when you're a pilot, right? Not always. We do spend time below the clouds as well, but it's not uncommon for us to be able to get up above the clouds, which uh, is always nice. Um, but yeah, flying itself is lots of fun. I really enjoy it. That's probably what I. Hey, can everybody see the document camera? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, already. Okay, so the first step is going to be folding your piece of paper in half lengthways. Hot dog style. Hot dog style? Yeah. So fold it over, try to get it as close to uh, even as possible. <laughs> 
I don't know how quickly I should uh, proceed with this, Mally. If you want to let me know if I'm going too fast, or if I can. The kids will let us know if you're going too fast. Yep. Okay. Okay. So after that, you're going to unfold it, and then fold the corners down. Let's do it. Fold them down into the center. Try to be as accurate as possible. There we go. Cool. And now the next step, you're going to fold the tip all the way down like this, but you need to make sure that you leave about a centimeter of space at the bottom where the tip is. That's an important part of the step. So leaving about one centimeter before. Yeah, right down at the bottom. So the tip no doesn't go all ahead. the way. Okay. Remember, boys and girls, let us know if we're going too fast. Yep, there we go. Can you just slow down a bit? <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's pretty, pretty simple so far. Oh, she's good. Right. Okay. So next step, we're going to fold these corners in to the center, and it's going to end up looking like this. So you should see this little bit of triangle popping out from the bottom. So Craig, can you hold that little triangle up just a bit? Because it's um, no, keep it folded, but just yeah, like there. There we can see that. Oh, hold if you hold it up just a touch, so we can see what is supposed there, right there. Yeah. Is it blurry on your end? Oh, uh, yeah, it's the uh, glare from on the camera. Light, yeah. It actually looks fine on on my laptop, but it's uh, when I look at the little screen with the camera, I can see what you're talking about there, kind of blends in yeah okay boys and girls we let us know we're ready to go drop this down a bit is that, is that a little better uh, yep yeah it's just the, it's the light it's it's yep. just white so yep. okay we're good to go gabby, gabby griffiths is ready okay so next you're going to take that little triangle and you're going to fold it up and over top, that's uh, there. No, there we are. You can see that triangle that was down below is now folded up and over top. Oh, that does just kind of disappear there, eh? It has trouble yeah. with the balance. There we go. So you fold the little triangle up. Now the next step, you're going to fold it in half again, but you have to make sure that you fold to the outside. So that little triangle stays down on the bottom. And there's only one more step after this. And that is folding the two wings all the way down. And you want the fold to go all the way to the tip. So you're going to fold that side so it's all the way flat. Like this. Here we 
here we go. And then flip it over and do the same on the other side. And then you end up with that for your paper airplane. Okay, May, um, would you be able to, it, it is much different than the ones that I've done before too, Sigrid, for sure. Yeah, can we start the folding from the beginning, please? Just so that yeah. we can see from the That's beginning. Yeah. yeah. I found too, the tighter you hold it, the worse it flies. So hold it a little loosely when you try it the first time, it'll fly and glide better. Okay, so first step, hold your piece of paper in half. to find the right light in this. Maybe this green tablecloth is the best. Then you're going to open it back up again. I hope that helps a little bit, maybe. Yeah, maybe. We'll fold it in half. Open it back up. And fold two corners down into the center. Like this. Nice. So, oh, Gabby got it to work. That's pretty cool. Um, and Sarah is asking if we're done now. This is this is the last thing that we need to do. Um, so, yeah, if you need to go, you can go. Uh, actually, we're probably going to end up. Out of our, our, no. Okay. Um, so, I do have other videos and stuff. If anybody wants to hang around, we can. So we can share more. them with Maui. Can we put them on our website for like a couple of days? Videos, I guess. Yeah. Um, Sigrid is asking what kind of brand of docu camera you use. Uh, I it's just an inexpensive one from the internet. Actually, I bought it from Amazon. Sigrid, it's called IPVO. I P E V O four. You want to put that in the chat? I P E B O number four. Yes. Oh, I'm not typing. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the the third step is folding the tip down, making sure that we leave about a centimeter of space at the bottom. Aaron's flew almost all the way into the closet. Nice. <laughs> awesome. You're welcome, parent. <laughs> if you're listening, you have paper airplanes flying all day. Yeah, this one works yeah. really well. Mine went um, yeah. into the hallway and downstairs. So next step is to fold the corners into the center. Making it should leave that little triangle. Is that background better? No, I'm just telling it still disappears. Well, yours isn't working. May you might have to refold it or maybe just hold it a little looser. Let the flaps at the top open up. You uh you still have the link to this if you want to try it. We can share it on the website if we okay. want to try it. Right, cool. And then after that step, we're gonna fold the tip. Oops. It is. We're going to fold the triangle up over top of the two ends. Oh, nice. Gabby's going to color hers like a water bomber. 
Oh, awesome. Well, exposure. Yeah. Are you going to do a yellow one or a carrots and peas one or uh, one of each? Everybody's favorite. Yeah, send us a you, picture if you make if you color it. Send us a picture, or you can send us a little video of maybe you throwing your air. So after you've folded the triangle up, you're going to fold it to the outside in half along the center line that you folded first. That looks much better. I turned the exposure down. That was much better. I think the difference is just because of my hand and sort of the whiteness of the paper. And then the final step is to fold the wings all the way down to the bottom. Try throwing it up and see what happens. It's cool. What happens, Aaron? Does it come down like a dart? It would be cool to see uh, if you made two and if they um, if they went the same distance. Uh, how do you fold the wings down again, Craig? From I think from the 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 second last or the last step when you had the wings open and then you fold it down. Yeah, it's downstairs now. Um, can you show me how to do it? Maybe from that angle, like what it looks. What what does the finished plane look like from your angle? Step, you think? Yeah, but from that step, yeah. From here, hold the wings all the way down like this. All the way down so that the edge of the wing is parallel or is in line with the bottom of the plane. See how that works, May? Well, I think she's, and then you turn it up um, onto the other side and do the same thing to the other wing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really cool plane. <laughs> 